today I am going to be talking about the editorial process and how to publish your paper. Um, I'm going to use Cell Press because I know it very well, but a lot of these um, tips that I'm going to be telling you about today will certainly apply to other journals. So just to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about, um, first I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the stem cell biology options at Cell Press. So a little about our family of journals and where you can publish. Then I'm going to focus on um, the publishing process and kind of take you through it and um, highlight some of the areas that I get most often get asked questions about. I'm really hoping that this will be a practically useful talk for you. And then if there's time, because I could talk about this for days, um, I'll talk a bit about editorial careers um, because that is an option as an alternative to an academic career. Okay, and I'll make sure to leave time for questions. So I want to tell you a little bit about the Cell Press family of journals. I hope you're familiar with our journals, um, but we've expanded in, in a lot in recent years. So Cell started almost 50 years ago, but now we're an all science publisher. So that means that in addition to the biological sciences, we publish in the physical sciences as well as clinical sciences. So um, we also have a uh, hybrid uh, research journals such as Cell Stem Cell where you have the option to publish in a subscription model or uh, open access. Um, we have 17 fully open access journals. We also publish uh, the whole trends series of review journals and we partner with several um, scientific societies to publish their society journals. So I've highlighted in red some of the journals that most often publish stem cell research. So I hope you're all familiar with Cell and cell stem cell and developmental cell. Um, but we also have this trio of open access journals, Cell Reports, and more recently Cell Reports Medicine and Cell Reports Methods. Um, last, I want to point out that we uh, partner with the International Society of Stem Cell Research's um, journal Stem Cell Reports. So they are part of our family of journals. And then if you have a protocol, because a lot of stem cell research is very technology driven, um, you can publish your paper in STAR protocols. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about cell stem cell since this is the regenerative medicine um, speaking series. So I want to talk a little bit about our scope. So cell stem cell covers uh, a full range of stem cell science. So that's foundational and translational insights into stem cell biology. And so I think of the journal as um, kind of falling into three main buckets of research. So first you'll have basic insights into stem, stem cell biology and often that you can conceive of that as endogenous stem cells and their function in repair, in aging, and in homeostasis. Um, we're very interested in cell states and plasticity of cell states and stemness. Um, we publish uh, more and more uh, therapeutic uh, leaf focused uh, research. So um, we have a format that Kat is very familiar with called the Clinical and Translational Report. And so this um, publishes the whole continuum um, from preclinical work to IND enabling studies to clinical trials. Um, as you all know, stem cell research is still in somewhat early phases of clinical development. So we've published um, several phase one clinical trials with cell therapies, as well as some um, interesting small molecule based uh, clinical trials. So that's cell and gene therapy, but then also, you know, therapeutically focused um, papers can also fall under um, the banner of disease modeling, using stem cells for drug screening. These are all um, areas in which we're very interested. And then finally, I would say, um, even historically, uh, as Kat mentioned earlier, a, a big part of the journal has been on technology development. So, and, and how it is applied in stem cells. So mRNA-based reprogramming was one of the earlier um, examples of tech development. And more recently, we published quite a lot in um, in vitro tissue models and um, advances in that. So organoid science, um, tissue engineering, in interesting intersections between material science applied to improve stem cell models. Um, and then stem cells are a wonderful uh, resource for doing genomics and genome editing um, research. So there's uh, several papers that we publish in that realm. So I know what I've just talked about is a little abstract. I've just told you about kind of broad categories that we publish in, and I thought it might be helpful to um, highlight some very specific examples too. So I pulled up um, some examples from uh, last year's Best of Cell Stem Cell. So every year we pick um, top 10 papers from the year based on readership, 
and um, citations and also our editorial interest. So here are some of the papers from last year. And so you'll see um, uh, the top two are, are great examples of um, in vitro tissue models and how they're used, applied in developmental biology. So this first paper um, used the gastroid model to understand how early heart development forms. And um, there's a lot of uh, movement in um, the early human uh, modeling of early human development. And so we published a paper um, creating a blastoid model, which you, you may be familiar with. Um, but then we also have published quite a bit of kind of bioengineering focused work. Um, here's an example here of microvessels being um, applied with ESL derived islets to improve their um, the graft uh, survival and function. And um, here is an example, uh, lastly, of the kind of temp development that I was telling you about and how stem cells can be really useful for um, you know, developing new lineage tracing and fate mapping um, technologies. Here I just want to highlight our really strong interest in clinical trials and um, translational research. And so here you'll see that last year we published some interim results from a clinical trial um, on uh, uh, do, using an encapsulation device uh, on stem cell derived islets and um, actually pulling the graphs out of the patients and showing um, what they look like and how their efficacy. Um, this paper is a, a little different flavor, but again, it's this clinical and translational report. And, and what this paper did was it, it really characterized in incredible detail um, the dopaminergic neurons derived from ESLs that were from the same um, do, uh, batch of cells that were then used in a clinical trial in the patient. So you could see, um, you could show the patients what these cells did in a rat model, and then they were later injected into patient brains. We'll see what comes of that trial. Okay, so I hope I gave you kind of initial insight into cell stem cell and what we're interested in, but now I wanna talk about the publishing process. So. I'm just gonna kind of go through the start from the start to the finish and highlight some areas that I get a lot of questions about. So one of the most common questions I get is about, you know, how do I choose the right journal? And so my advice to you is really look through your paper and what you're citing. Look at your reference list. What, what journals pop up the most for you? Um, and start to read through those journals and, and take, a, take a, a hard look at whether or not you're seeing the kind of research that you're doing in that journal. Um, the, that's going to be the first uh, indicator of whether or not they're interested in that. But then it's also good to get some outside input. Um, you're so familiar with your own work, but uh, it's, it's good to get someone else who might not be in your lab or even uh, do your kind of research to give you an honest appraisal of whether or not the, the manuscript is written, has the kind of breadth um, that the journal that you're aiming for would go for. Um, it's great to talk to editors at conferences. And if you don't see us at a conference, you can always write us an email and we can have a Zoom call um, to kind of send a you know in-person kind of pre-submission inquiry and, and tell us about the work so we can we can give you our honest feedback about whether or not it aligns with the journal scope. Um, in lieu of that, you can also send us an, an email with uh, the abstract, maybe some of the figures, and a cover letter, and that would be a pre-submission inquiry. Um, the last option, and I'll talk a lot more about this um, later on in the talk, is you could sub consider submitting to multiple journals at the same time. And so this option we have now is called the Cell Press Community. Okay, so I want to tell you a little bit more about pre-submission queries because I am often asked of whether or not they're worth the effort. Um, and I think that they are. And it's because it, it's a way that you can kind of shop your paper around before you actually submit it. You can send a pre-submission inquiry to multiple journals at a time. And based on the kind of feedback we give you, you can kind of tailor the way you end up writing the manuscript, put the final, polish, final polishes on it, based on which, paper, which journal you're going to submit it to. So you know, what you do with this is you, you, you tell us you know, why would we be interested in the work. And um, you can ask us about the format. 
So for example, we um, publish a lot of uh, resource articles that are really uh, data focused or methods focused. And we have different standards for those types of articles than um, standard research articles. So we can tell you about our criteria and what we'd be looking for and um, give you feedback to help you know whether or not we would be likely to send the paper for in-depth peer review. Um, uh, I think I talked a little bit about how you go about this. Oh, some of the benefits of this are that, you know, you get a really quick response. We get back to you within the two days. And it's like having a conversation with the editor. It's not just a yes or no. It's asking you questions about the paper, giving you a little feedback about what we would need in order to send it out for peer review. So it can be educational as well. Um, I will say that the one caveat about pre-submission inquiries is that it's not a full in-depth read of the paper. And so if you really feel like the journal needs that, you're always welcome to just to submit a paper and have us read it in depth. We'll get back to you typically within five days for that. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about writing and submitting your paper. So here are my tips on this. So you really gotta remi remind yourself, even though scientific writing can be very dry, you're telling a story um, and you should never forget that. So. Uh, Tell it as simply and concisely as you can, but don't oversimplify. And keep in mind the broader readership of the journal. So that's why earlier I was saying it's a good idea to get feedback from people outside your own lab. Okay, at this point, and I get this question quite a bit, um, do you need to follow all of our specific you know, formatting guidelines? And the answer is no. We do not enforce this at all um, at submission or for peer review. But what we do ask is that you Think about what's important for peer review, right? So we need access to uh, important data sets because reviewers will have to look at that. Um, so make sure that you submit those into a repository and have them um, anonymously available for review. Um, I also recommend that people uh, make sure that the methods are written in a detailed enough manner that you can have a really strong peer review. We have no limits on our um, length for the methods. So, you know, uh, I, I recommend being as thorough as you can from the beginning because you will avoid having questions later on um, that could have been avoided if you had been more transparent in the beginning. Um, and then the last thing I would say, although I don't think I mentioned it here, is you don't have to stick to the supplemental guidelines, the limits on that, but we try not to overwhelm our reviewers. <laughs> and so if you have like 30 supplemental figures, that could be really cumbersome for them. And so I'd strongly uh, recommend to avoid that. Okay, the cover letter is important. Um, and the reason is because this is your chance to essentially have a conversation with the editor, <laughs> right? Um, so you can say things that you wouldn't say in the paper itself to the editor. You can explain to them why the paper is important, what debate in the field it might be addressing, um, and you can say it more plainly than you would in the way an in, in introduction or abstract is written. Um, <laughs> I say address it to the right journal because you would be shocked at how often <laughs> that is not the case. Um, and you can address it to anyone. You can address it to our editorial team. You could address it to the editor-in-chief. Um, that doesn't really matter that much, but at least make sure that you're not mentioning another journal because it just doesn't look good. <laughs> and this is also a place where you can tell us stuff that you wouldn't necessarily put in the paper like a competitive situation that you might be aware of or perhaps a collaborative one if you want to um, coordinate publication with another group this is a place where you can tell us that that you would like to do that and then we would want them to also say the same and then we could be more open throughout the process without breaching confidentiality um, this is also where you can put reviewers suggestions and or exclusions um, we always uh, honor reviewer exclusions but it's important we ask that you only exclude like three people max, because if you start excluding everyone in the field, it becomes very hard to find appropriate reviewers. Um, if you are gonna make suggestions, it's especially useful, suggestions are useful for, to us for editors if there's an aspect of your paper that, for example, is very technical and might not be part of our normal wheelhouse. Um, so if there's a, a new technology that you're using, you might want to suggest some people doing that. Or if you're working in a different model system than we're used to seeing, you, you might want to uh, suggest reviewers for that. So that's where suggestions are going to come in 
um, more handy. And, and don't suggest to your friends or people that you've collaborated with because we, we think about these things and um, we know <laughs> and, and we look for them and it's a really important part of our job to avoid conflicts of interest. Um, okay, I think we've covered everything here. Okay, my next tip is um, basically to craft an engaging title and abstract. <laughs> and I know that it's painstaking, um, but the title and abstract are exceptionally important because this is the first thing that we see as editors um, when, we, when your paper comes in and is submitted. And it's the first thing that reviewers see as well. So um, when I send out a review request, uh, the reviewers are just gonna get the title and abstract after you know, my letter to them. And so that is what will help them get be interested in it and agree to put in all that work. Um, it, it's also what comes into my email and gets me excited, right? I read the title and abstract, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to read this paper. Um, and if it's not written in an engaging way or it doesn't tell me the models that you're using, um, you're missing an opportunity. Okay. I often, it's funny, I, I asked this at lunch, so <laughs> um, I often get asked about preprints and what our policy is on this. So our policy at Cell Press is that we're totally fine with um, you putting your paper on a preprint server. And in fact, it can be useful at times. Um, it can be useful if it's a competitive paper. It can be useful if it's, if it's relying on a certain technology that isn't published yet. Um, it can be helpful for when I, uh, people send me a pre-submission inquiry if I can just easily see the whole paper and look for whether or not um, specific experiments that we would require for peer review are there or not. So um, we're totally fine with it. I would say the one caveat is that if your paper is on a topic that is of high public health interest, it's, I, it's not always advisable to put it on a preprint because until it's, you know, properly vetted and, and you can make sure that it's you know, publication quality, you might not want to surface those findings to the public and that may misunderstand it. This is a little bit more about what we're looking for at Cell Stem Cell. So this is a little busy side, but so you've written your paper, you've decided to submit it to a journal and then it gets, um, I get the email on my desk about it. Um, so what we do at Cell Stem Cell is it comes in, uh, we get a little spreadsheet every day, a little kind of voting spreadsheet where we have like our initial discussion about the papers. And we might say like, oh, this sounds really interesting, or I handled something that was making very similar conclusions to this paper. I want this paper, you know, those, those types of things. And, and so that's just all based on the title and abstract. So then I assign a handling editor to your paper. So that person is then responsible for reading it in depth, doing the background research on you know the, what's the existing literature, writing it up, and then presenting the paper to the rest of the editorial team. So these are the types of, we ask ourselves you know as we're deciding whether or not to send it for peer review, uh, does the paper address an important and timely question? Um, will the findings be of broad interest to a general stem cell audience? Um, how, how much will they advance the field? Um, if it's a resource article, we'll ask, you know, what is the resource value of the tool or data set that's being reported? Has it been validated sufficiently? Um, does it ma match those criteria for, for sending things for peer review? Then we'll also look at kind of more detailed things about reporting standards. So I already talked about the methods, but um, we, you know, stem cell research can be really ethically sensitive. So we might look for an ethics statement. We want to make sure that um, you've done your due diligence. Um, if it's a clinical trial, we'll check whether or not it's been registered um, or pre-registered uh, before patients were enrolled, et cetera. Um, and as you all may know, the ISSCR published um, new ethics guidelines for certain types of research um, for chimeras, uh, embryo models, those types of um, questions. And so we'll, we'll look to whether or not that that has been properly uh, reported. Um, and then as I said before, we'll look at the resource availability because um, it's very important to us that uh, single cell or, or RNA-seq data sets um, have been deposited and made uh, available to um, reviewers for the uh, rigor of the peer review process. And often this is not reported. <laughs> and, and so we will actually send the paper back to you. Um, if, if we don't have that information. 
and it can really slow things down. Um, okay, so you know the peer review process, if we decide to send a paper out for review, um, collaboratively through the editorial team, we decide you know, who to ask and what, what areas of the paper should be covered by reviewers. Because you know, so much of research today is very interdisciplinary. So we'll have to really make sure that various aspects of um, the paper are covered. Um, and what we tell our reviewers is that we want them to balance the critical nature of the process with a constructive mindset. Um, we're not trying to tear down the papers that we send for review. Our hope is that things will go well. Um, and so we, tell, we explicitly tell them that, and then we say, if you find that the conceptual advance is a strong one for the field, then try to focus your critiques on what would be required to support or refute the main conclusions of the paper. Because we get a ton of feedback that reviewers ask for the world and that the review process can go on for a long time. So we try to, at the beginning, tell them to really focus on the main conclusions. And we try to hold ourselves to that, too, because you know, we can get greedy and want the paper to be, you know, tell us everything. But we know that um, it's very hard to decide when a paper is ready or when, it, when enough is enough. I'm sure, I'm sure you all have, have ideas about that as well. Um, OK, so once the, uh, we get the reviews in, we make um, some editorial decisions. And so often, the decision might be to invite a revision. And so my tips about um, revisions are to, you know, and these are pretty basic tips, but often people don't do this. So it's very important to include the entire reviewer comments in your response letter. Um, I find it useful to have a high level summary at the beginning of what you've done um, to help the editor kind of make sure that we're focusing on, on those really important experiments that you've done um, in the revision. Um, it's useful to you know, use different color coding in the response letter, but also often people don't um, actually mark up the revised manuscript text, and that can make it difficult for us and for reviewers. So I recommend that you do that. If, um, oh, so we have recently added, well, maybe it's not so recent anymore, but we recently added an uh, end part of the discussion called the limitations of study. And I suggest that you use that to your advantage. Um, this is where you can explicitly talk about you know, what you maybe wish you could have done, but can't. And not just because it's out of the scope of the paper, but because it, there might be experimental limitations that you know, prevent you from doing that. Um, it's a way to kind of, one of the ways in which you can more publicly address some of the critiques and, and how you responded to them without actually having to experimentally respond to them. So, and, and people find them engaging and useful. So I would use that to your advantage. Um, uh, the last thing I'll say here is that if we invite revisions and you're unsure about some of the reviewers' questions or you don't think that something that they've asked for is really going to advance the paper, but it's going to be a lot of work, write to us. And it's better to do that earlier than later because we can have a discussion with you. We can go back to the reviewers and clarify certain points. We can make sure that you're really focusing on what the key experiments that are needed for the revision. And so it's better to um, find out rather than make assumptions. Um, <laughs> lastly, I'll say always be polite and professional in your response. You may vehemently disagree with reviewer one about a certain point, but it's not going to help your cause to be overly combative in, or condescending in your tone if they've misunderstood something. Um, you know, remember, these are people on the other side. And they, they might be harsh in the way that they've talked <laughs> to you, um, but they're also trying to help, as are we. So um, try to be constructive, and we will try to hold them to it, too. OK, sometimes we don't invite revisions, um, and we have to reject a paper. And my advice on what to do when you receive a rejection is you know, to read the letter and the comments very carefully, and then step away. Because you're obviously going to have an initial kind of emotional reaction to this news. Um, so I would wait <laughs> and then read them again. Um, and then if you choose to resubmit somewhere else, you really should just 
and take some of the comments into, into account, even if you disagree with them. Even if you think the reviewers misunderstood something, they might have misunderstood something because of the way you presented it in the manuscript. So it, you really should take the opportunity to refine the manuscript based on the reviews before you go ahead and resubmit somewhere else. Um, I'm very surprised when sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we might send a paper out for review and a reviewer will tell us, I already reviewed this somewhere else and it's the same exact paper. <laughs> and, and that's really disappointing because it's like they put a lot of work into that and nothing is shifted from that. Um, and it doesn't serve science and it doesn't serve you um, to not use that information. Um, so if the decision is negative and you want to say something to the editors, I strongly suggest waiting at least at least 24 hours um, <laughs> because um, because you actually have to you know think like you know be honest with yourself are, are the reviewers making some fair points um, are you having an emotional response if, if you after waiting decide that no something is wrong here or or I can address this great um, then you know talk talk to us and so more in rebutting. So some people, I think, don't realize that you can't actually formally appeal a decision. Um, we entertain all rebuttals. Um, we have a whole editorial meeting just for rebuttals. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, but you can really only do it once. Um, you can't just continually argue with editors. But if you do, I recommend that you really focus on the science. Be concise and specific. Um, essentially, what you should do is write a point-by-point -point response as if you're writing a revision letter. And tell us, you know, where is there um, misunderstanding? Or where do you think, you know, you could address this in a timely way with some new experiments? Even if you don't have the data yet, you can tell us what you would do. Um, just arguing um, without adding new data is usually not a recipe for success. Um, so, you know, especially with the first round of review and just saying like, no, you, my paper should be accepted now. Um, that, that is usually not um, what reviewers are going to find convincing. Um, and then the last thing, again, be polite and respectful. If a paper is rejected, you also have an option at Cell Press to transfer your paper to another Cell Press journal. And so uh, this can be a kind of confusing process, so I want to explain what it what it really means. And so, essentially, it's um, the concept is kind of like portable peer review, right? You can take the reviews and um, even the reviewer identity, if it's within Cell Press, and give those to editors at another at another journal. So, some of the papers that we publish were initially reviewed at Cell, and um, Cell declined to reconsider the paper, but there might be parts of it that were strong enough for cell stem cell. And so we'll have a discussion with the authors and can continue the consideration process, meaning that we will do our best to send that paper once revised back to the same reviewers. And if we can't, then we will at least um, share the reviews and response with the new people and ask them to really focus on how well um, the revisions have addressed the original comments. So it's, it's really um, a continuation. If you don't like the reviews you get, if you feel like they were totally off or that, you know, they're just coming at your paper from the wrong angle, then you can start fresh at any of our journals. You don't have to tell us that it was you know, previously in another journal. If you want to, you can. And then you can say, but I still want to start fresh. And we'll honor that. Um, we also, um, you know, we know that you put a lot of time into revising papers. Uh, reviewers put a lot of time into uh, considering them. And so we want to make sure that things move along in a constructive and productive way. And so one of the things that we've been doing more recently is we actually have a transfer team at Cell Press. So there are a group of editors that just focus on helping authors find a home for their paper after review. And so um, if you you know, if your paper doesn't go well at some journal, what you can do is you can write to this transfer team and you can say, look, I'm interested in doing this for revision, but I can't do this thing that reviewer three asked for. I'm not doing those serial transplantation studies or what have you. And 
kind of just give them your point by point in a revision plan. And then they will do the work for you to talk to editors at a bunch of different journals and then give you a plan for what would work at a specific journal or set of journals. If you do X, Y, and Z, you can go to sell reports. If you want to do you know, just this one thing, you can go to iScience or you know, kind of give you a plan so you can decide, OK, well, I need to get this paper out now, <laughs> so I'm just going to take this. Or you might have some data in hand or some planned revisions already and then you know, decide to pursue one of the routes that they give you. So this is something that we've, we've been doing for about a, two years now um, to just provide more service to authors as far as what your options are. Okay, so if everything goes well and you know, you've know you revised your paper and it gets re-reviewed and uh, feedback is positive, we'll send you an editorial accepted in principle decision. But before we can actually formally accept a paper, there are a lot of kind of um, formatting um, requirements that you have to make sure you take care of. And so I just want to point out some of the things that we do as editors and have a lot of back and forth with others. I'm sure a lot of you in this room have dealt with us in this, um, is the methods. The methods are really important to us at Cell Press because we think that this really is one of the you know foundations of serving reproducibility and making sure that your paper is useful. And so we have these star methods that are extremely detailed. Um, and we also have a, like a key resource table that's associated with it, where we ask you to give us all the antibodies, our IDs, like really be as thorough as you can so that anyone else reading your paper can you know, build from it. After acceptance, we take every single paper that we're about to publish through an image forensics process. And so that's what I, I have a screenshot here of an example of one of these. And so this is not the you know best software. It comes up with a lot of false positives. Um, and so these our papers get flagged a lot, especially Western blots and um, microscopy. And so when this happens, you need to be ready and organized um, and be able to respond to us. Because I might see something come up where there's some strange autofluorescent signal and I have to ask you about it. And so I'll write to the corresponding author and say, hey, look, something came up with this in image forensics. Please get back to me in 48 hours, right? So you should have everything, all the underlying data, the raw data for your that's in your manuscript really well organized when you're at this stage. I mean, ideally, when you write up the paper, but um, I can I have seen this kind of hold papers up in the past, and it doesn't reflect well on the lab, um, and it, it can be a sticking point. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this community review process because it's something that we're really excited about, and it's and we're trying it, and it's it's new for us. So um, traditionally at Cell Press, we used to have this option where you could co-submit to two journals. Um, for example, if your paper was really um, showing something cool with metabolism, but also in stem cells, you might co-submit it to cell metabolism and cell stem cell. And then we would you know, pick the peer reviewers together, and then you could take it from there. So now we do this, but in a more um, shared fashion. So it's called Cell Press Community Review. And so this is a kind of busy slide, but what it shows you is this is basically how the process works. An author submits to the Cell Press community and then can say, you know, which journals they're potentially interested in. So you might be interested, say like, I want the editors at Cell, at Cell Stem Cell, at Cell Reports Medicine, at Cell Reports to look at this paper. And then we'll all kind of do our initial read, like, like each of us will have a handling editor read the paper and say, okay, um, we'll peer review this paper. And so this is kind of a way to help you find the journals that are actually interested in peer reviewing the paper more quickly. Because what we've heard from authors is that you, the serial desk rejects are you know, a, a blow to uh, their waste of time, and they can feel bad. <laughs> and so if you can submit to one, one portal and kind of decide where the paper should be reviewed um, or get a lot of decisions on that, that'll save a lot of time. So, the journals who want to peer review the paper will do that. And then 
when we get the reviews back, we'll kind of make very specific revision plans and send them to the authors. So it's kind of like what I was telling you with transfer, but it's all at, at, at this earlier stage where cell stem cell might say, well, we want you to do these transplantation experiments and you have to validate this cell line and do this all in a whole nother IPS line, <laughs> right? And then um, another journal might say, well, actually, we're okay without the in vivo studies, but we really do need this one aspect to be validated more. And then so you'll kind of get uh, a couple of different revision ideas and then decide what you're willing to do, what your timeline is, and where you would want to resubmit. And then we ask you to pick at that point for resubmission. So then you res resubmit to one journal. Um, it's, it's still in its infancy. Um, there are some great things about it. There's, it's obviously a lot of work up front for a lot of different editorial teams. Um, but the feedback we're getting so far is that it's, it's been really helpful and constructive for authors. So um, this is the team. Um, so we have a team uh, here on the left that are our community review. And then there are editors at all of our different journals that um, make the specific decisions for their journal. Um, so it, it's, it's been fun for us because it, we get to learn so much more about the other journals and what they're looking for as well. Um, and it's an interesting collaboration. So this is here is, is an example of a paper that um, came to, uh, through the community review and that we published at Cell Stem Cell last year. Um, and so when we published this paper, so this is the paper, um, we also did a little interview with the authors in, in a backstory and they kind of tell you about the process. So if you're interested in kind of hearing from the authors that actually went through this, what it was like, um, I recommend that you read that. Okay, we have a little more time and I just wanna maybe spend five minutes talking about this. I often get asked about editorial careers. Um, I've been doing this for 11 years and I love it. It's a super stimulating job. You never get bored. Um, and I like talking about it because really for me, um, it was going to a talk just like this that inspired me to pursue an editorial career. So um, I wanna just tell you a little bit. So here's a little bit about my story. So this is, my story isn't that different than a lot of people that end up pursuing an editorial career. I uh, pursued PhD research, um, I studied hematopoiesis for that, and then I really switched gears and started studying um, epigenetic mechanisms of reprogramming during my postdoc. I did a pretty short postdoc, it was about two and a half years, and then I learned about an opening at Cell Stem Cell, and it sounded like it was perfect for me. It was a reviews editor position, so I commissioned all the reviews for the journal, but also we publish a lot on you know, ethics, social issues, regulatory issues in stem cell research, and so I commissioned a lot of work on that too. So it was really fun for me to be involved with both the science and the um, other interesting aspects of stem cell research. So I did that for about well, four years, and then um, a kind of more standard manuscript editor position became open on the journal. So that would be like just handing, handling the research um, primarily and not dealing with the reviews. So I did that for about a year. And then um, the editor-in-chief position opened up and I applied for that. And um, I've been doing that for a little over five years. And uh, at some point I started um, taking on more responsibilities as an executive editor and I work with other journals. So I um, oversee developmental cell and I launched um, Cell Reports Methods. So there's, there's a lot of kind of career development that one can have a, as an editor. Um, and I often get asked like, what's, what's your daily life like? What are you, what are you actually doing? Because I think there's some misconceptions. Um, sometimes people think there's a lot of writing. There really isn't, it's not that much writing, except decision letters. <laughs> um, it's, it's really a lot more reading. It's really about your critical thinking skills. It's a kind of, um, it's a very kind of academic job in a way. Um, so you spend a lot of time reading papers. Um, we have editorial meetings three days a week. Um, like I told you, one's focused on rebuttals, uh, one's focused on our front matter, one we just talk about our editorial decisions, um, we do a journal watch, um, those are the types of things we do at editorial meeting. Um, you spend a lot of time finding reviewers, um, you know, thinking about what to aspects of a paper need to be covered by the review process, and you know, doing research on who are the experts. We have our own mental Rolodex and our reviewer database, but we're always trying to expand that. 
especially now that we're even more aware of you know, the importance of DEI and making sure that the, we're getting diverse opinions on papers and that we're including a broader range of people in making the journal as great as it can be. So we're focused on finding the right experts. We're also trying to find people based all over the world, um, making sure that we ask women. Um, so these are, that, that can take a lot of time. <laughs> um, we spend a lot of time reading and evaluating the, the reviews. And, and that's a fun part of it. You know, you, you send a paper out for review and then th three weeks later you get the reviews back and you get to find out what other people think um, and try to integrate uh, the diverse opinions. Um, as Rob pointed out to me, <laughs> you never get a consensus. And so you have to build that and decide what is really essential for this paper and what can we, you know, let go of. Um, so, uh, you know, making and writing the decisions, reading point by point responses, appeals take quite a bit of our time. Um, but there's also some kind of like more fun things that we do that aren't just like staring at a computer. Um, I go to conferences, I organize conferences, um, I do things like come to institutions and do site visits and meet with scientists directly. Um, so th there's, a, there's a broad range of, of things that one can do as an editor. Um, so just a last couple of points here. The daily life, you know, has its pluses and minuses. So they're very hectic. Your to-do list kind of never ends, right? There's always more to do. Um, sometimes you have to make really tough decisions and upset people, and that can be emotionally challenging. Um, these decisions are tough, and it's a desk job. You're, you're not working with your hands anymore. A lot of editors start cooking a lot or <laughs> take up <laughs> art projects or you know other things to stimulate um, what they once did in the hood. Um, okay, sorry, I started with the negative things. <laughs> the positive things are that it's extremely exciting. You learn something new like every day. You never get bored. Um, there's a fantastic group of people that work at Cell Press, and it's really awesome to work with people that are so dedicated to uh, serving scientists and you know the, are interested in learning new things. Um, you also don't just disappoint authors, sometimes you really help shepherd a paper through and it becomes better through the review process and you get to see that and you make people really happy. Um, and you get to really have a nice kind of view of the field of research that you're supporting and contribute to it in a different way. Um, like I said, it's a great place to work and there's a lot of growth opportunities. So if any of you are interested in pursuing that kind of career, I'm very happy to talk to you more about that. We're always hiring. Um, Last couple of things, you know, if you actually want to prepare for this kind of role, um, the advice that I have for you is to, you know, be proactive. Um, talk to editors when they come, when you see them at conferences, um, go to career fairs, do like uh, informational interviews, find out as much as you can. Um, we have an internship program and um, PhD students and postdocs uh, join that internship program, so that gives you a real um, sense of what the, the job is like. Um, and we even have um, a, what's called a future editors group, which is basically like an application pool for people that are potentially interested. And so you could like give your CV, um, do some initial screenings for a, a editor role. And then if something came up that matched for you, the, the team would reach out to you. Um, in terms of preparing yourself for this kind of role, I mean, what you do now is preparation for what an editorial role is like. Um, you know, be curious. Uh, read outside your specific field of research. Um, make sure that you're going to talks, that you're going to talks that aren't just about your field of work, but really broad. Um, and try to seek a range of experiences. If there's a postdoc association or a student group that would give you opportunities to organize events or, you know, be scientifically you know, cur curatorial in a way, those are all things that could prepare someone for thinking like an editor. Um, and then just to tell you just a little bit about the interview process, something that I really like about it is that 
it's skill-based. It's not about your CV and your publication record. It's about your critical thinking skills. And we give you an opportunity to really show that through the interview process. So, you know, you send in your CV and cover letter, please, because people don't send cover letters anymore, and I find it as a missed opportunity. <laughs> um, but then we give you a written test that's kind of, you know, asking you to critique papers and tell us what you think about them. Um, and it's pretty extensive. So that's the first kind of skill-based thing. And then we'll have a phone interview with you, and then we'll give you a manuscript test to when we actually come in, or now we do this on Zoom often. And it's kind of like an editorial meeting. Um, we'll give you some papers to read, and you have to read them really quickly. Um, and then we'll come back maybe an hour later, and we'll have what would an editorial meeting would be like, where you kind of pr present the, the paper, you talk about what you liked about it, what you thought might be lacking, whether or not you'd send it for peer review. Um, so we get a sense of how you think, and then you also get a sense of what the job would be like. Um, and then, of course, we bring you in and, and you get to meet people. But um, that was more so pre-COVID. Now, I haven't even met in person some of the people who I work with on a daily basis. And that's good and bad, right? I mean, it's wonderful that we can work in different places all over the world and have that flexibility of working from home. But something is lost when you're not all there together. Um, okay, well, I know I covered a lot of topics. I hope that you have questions. We have about 10 minutes for them. So thank you so much for your attention and for having me. Um, I think we can take questions now. <laughs> Great, yeah, thank you for the question. So I'm gonna repeat it because I think probably the people on Zoom couldn't hear that. So the first question was about how many papers we get on average um, a week. Um, you know, it, you would be surprised at how up and down it is for us. So cell stem cell is low volume compared to some other journals. So we get about 20 papers a week, um, uh, more or less. Yeah, and so that ends up being about like if you're an, a handling editor, you might get two, two or three papers a day to handle. The second question was about ah, location. Um, so uh, yes, you're right. In the past, all of Cell Press was located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I started there. Um, I, I guess I was a pioneer of remote working because I moved to LA about eight years ago, but um, the pandemic, one of, I guess, the upsides of it has been that we are a far more global company now because we have realized that we can um, you know, work really effectively across time zones and borders. And so Cell Press is actually um, run by Elsevier and Relax, which is a global company. So we have offices in Amsterdam is actually where, where the headquarters of Elsevier is. Um, we have a lot of people in the London Wall office. So um, people are in London, in Cambridge, in Beijing, Shanghai, and Amsterdam as our main offices. But even now there are editors all over the place working home-based um, in many time zones in many countries. All right, so first question, uh, how would your tips and tricks as an editor might help you know, junior trainees learn to read papers? Like what do you, how do you quickly get the take home message and like key, uh, key data takeaways from a paper? And then secondly, uh, we all know peer review process is kind of you know, evolving and preprints are becoming a big part of that. And I was wondering, where do you see the peer review process in five or 10 years, maybe ideally versus actually? <laughs> Those are two big questions. Okay, the first was about uh, how, oh, tips for how to read a paper. Yeah, you know, I read papers very differently now than I used to. Um, I, uh, I really try to take in the cover letter that will give me like the main points and maybe a little background. I actually start reading a paper and do a ton of background research before I even get into the results. Um, then I, the, I'll PubMed, Scopus, I'll start to make sure that I'm aware of you know, the existing literature, what is this paper building itself on? So that's actually foundational for the way I look at papers. So I really think about the background and the question, what it's adding to that first. And then I basically read the figures. Uh, I mean, obviously I'll go through the paper, um, and if it's an area that I don't know as well, I'll spend more time on the introduction, but it's like, you know, really think about, about the data. I mean, that is the paper. That's what writes the paper. So um, it, it's kind of like a, a back and forth in a way of that. And then, and then I'll always look at the discussion because I feel like that's where the authors have their voice the most, you know, and where you're able to, to really kind of 
drive down you know what you think is most important about the paper and and to also be honest about what you think the next steps are so i guess i would say you know make sure that you're familiar with the with the background and and what this is building on is is at least how i i read papers <laughs> okay second question the future of peer review is <laughs> a huge question <laughs> you know what do i think the future of i, I guess that's very broad um, i think that Hmm. I mean, I guess you coach this in the context of preprints. I mean, I think that the future of peer review is that there's going to be more and more transparency around it. That's what you're seeing in so many different aspects about it. And I think that this is useful in many ways. Um, for example, preprints, um, people knowing what else is out there. And I think it helps people be more collaborative than competitive in ways that are helpful. Um, but I don't see, you know, the anonymous peer review going away. Um, we do a lot of surveys of reviewers and authors, and there's a certain aspect to it that is really important for protecting junior people that are speaking up um, about, you know, their views on a field that might f seem controversial. And we see a lot of that in the stem cell field. Um, and I think it's important to be protected as you're being critical yet constructive. Um, so I don't necessarily see that going away, although I, I, ha I mean, I, I appreciate that even now many journals publish the names of the reviewers. Um, and I know that there's a push for that. I wonder what you think about that. Can, can I ask mm -hmm. a follow-up mm -hmm. to that? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, one of the you know, things that I've seen that I think works really well is that the reviewers are still anonymous to the author, but the reviewers are known to each other. Mm -hmm. And even just that little bit of accountability where someone knows that it's you mm -hmm. um, tends to increase the quality of reviews. So wondering if um, that's something you guys have discussed or thought about or, and, uh, or, or are willing to try out in sort of a pilot uh, to see if that improves the, the quality of review overall. Yeah, you know, I think we've thought about it. Um, again, I think some of the same issues come up when it comes about like protecting uh, someone's voice. I mean, the thing is, I know who they are, <laughs> um, so someone does know who who they are, and and you know, we have a reviewer and author pool that overlaps quite a bit. Um, so I think there is some accountability there. I, for me, what I think those models that have the openness among reviewers. The other aspect about it that I think is more important is the collaboration among them and the discussion. And so that's where we focus our efforts. And this is, I mean, as you know, this is why we do cross consultation among the reviewers. And I know it's, it's, it is anonymous in, in some regards, but um, that's where I've seen the most movement and the most positive um, kind of aspect. Of, of, of that process is when, when we go back to reviewers and say, okay, this is what reviewers two said. Do you agree with this? Why or why not? Um, so I, I think that that's the more important part of that kind of e-life model. Um, but uh, it's, it's something that we've definitely discussed and, and until we have enough reviewers saying that they're okay with it, I don't see it going anywhere because it would be really unfortunate if people didn't want to review papers because they didn't feel safe to do that. So I saw your bold point of not overselling in the cover letter. And for <laughs> me, that's very interesting because the cover letter is a it's an area where it's, it's more you know secret. You don't know what all the diversity of other people are putting in a cover letter. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you had any insight or could like draw any lines around like, you know, what what how to be effective in a cover letter or what do you look for and, and, and like what do you think is too much or like not relevant to your decision making? Thanks, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I didn't really explain what overselling means. And so what I will see happen that I don't think is very effective or useful is that someone might connect their specific paper and that findings to this like much broader, bigger question that eventually might be addressed and spend a little too much time on that when the paper's not really about that. So for example, you know, we're learning about this process in um, developmental hematopoiesis and how uh, blood cells form and then trying to connect that to say making hematopoietic stem cells from pluripotent stem cells. It's like, yes, I know that that is a, like part of what learning about the developmental biology will um, 
you know, the, the importance in, of linking those two, but, but that's not that useful in the cover letter because it's kind of like making these grandiose claims about the paper that aren't really about the paper. So I would say stick to what's in the paper. And instead, what you might focus on is, okay, there's been this debate about what's important, and the reason our paper is important is because it's clarifying this question. You know, like really distilling that for an editor I, is useful. Um, highlighting in that perhaps some of the references that you really want us to look at so that we can compare. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't just rehash the abstract, but if there are, you know, cover letters that maybe have bullet points that are they about the really essential findings or interesting new technologies that they're using, that, that can be useful. Um, so I would say stick to your paper in the sense of um, when you're thinking about like future directions, but it's okay to talk about the history and, and how your, pa your findings build on really key debates in the field or what, what your paper might be doing. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Can you estimate what percent of your papers that get published actually got invited for revisions versus rejected originally and then ultimately rebutted? I'm not sure if I have, I don't think I have the percentages on that. And that's shifting for us, to be honest. Um, I think in the past, we used to maybe be even more conservative around, around um, inviting revisions um, because I have a mentality of um, giving authors the choice about what they're going to do. And we also find that sometimes revisions or what reviewers want can take a really long time. And I don't want a process to take like a year. <laughs> um, so especially in the past, if we thought that what would be needed, even if we liked the paper and we wished that we could you know, invite a revision, if we thought that was just going to be way too onerous for authors, we would reject the paper with an open door so as not to hold a paper kind of hostage to us because if you're under active revision, you can't submit elsewhere. Um, but I would say, you know, my mindset's shifted on that a little bit. Um, we try to, when we're going to overrule something, we're pretty clear on that up front. And if we invite revisions, we'll tell authors that. Um, but I, percentage, honestly, I don't know. Um, the difference, but I would just say it's shifting. We probably have more papers under that are invited now than we, we did before. Hey, um, I'm wondering about people going into editorial careers. Are they usually coming from having done an academic postdoc, or are there people coming straight from their PhD or transitioning from other career paths like industry? Like, what's the most common, and is there like a recommended trajectory for that? That's a great question. Um, I would say a lot of people have done a short postdoc, um, but it's not required. Um, and the reason I say this, and it's what I did, um, is because by doing a postdoc after your PhD, you have demonstrated that you can shift um, to asking a new question, broadening your scope, you know, or your your interest. You have to you have to take on a new area of research and quickly digest it and know what to focus on. And so those kind of skill sets are really useful in an editorial career. But um, increasingly, we don't require a postdoc. Um, you do. I recommend having already graduated if you're going to apply for a job because. If your graduation date is, you know, isn't clear or it's in the future, we can't hire you. Um, there are some people that come with, say, some biotech experience or having done, um, I don't know, something else. But that's not that common, and I don't know that that helps you that much because, for the most part, you're working with academics as an editor. Um, does that answer your question? Let's just once again thank Dr. Chari for a just amazing, comprehensive, and insightful talk. Thank you so much. <laughs>